Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, good evening for some of you from Washington, from Washington DC. Uh, my name is Dr. Joel Amebo. I'm an assistant professor of security studies and the Africa Center faculty lead on youth peace and security. Uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our alumni, colleagues, and partners across the African continent and beyond who have registered for today's webinar entitled Trends, Youth Bulge, Security, and Peace in Africa. Uh, this webinar is the first in a quarterly series of discussions that the Africa Center will host, co-host with the Office of the African Union Youth Envoy and the African Union Youth for Peace Africa program. Before we introduce the objectives for today's seminar, uh, webinar, uh, I would like to turn over to my director, our director, Ms. Amanda Dory, for remarks. Over to you. Thank you, Joelle, and good morning. Siku and Zuri, assalamu alaikum, bon dia, bonjour to all who are dialed in for our webinar today. I am greeting you from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, which is here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, DC. It's truly a delight today to be co-hosting this program with our African Union colleagues and to be joined by a terrific panel to discuss youth, peace, and security in Africa and ways forward to tackle the myriad security challenges that face all African countries and the United States and all countries around the world when we think of some of the, the most uh, pressing challenges that are facing us at this point in time. I'm pleased to say that we have more than 600 participants who have signed up today, who have registered, coming from more than 68 countries. So clearly this topic resonates uh, across Africa and, and well beyond. My name is Amanda Dory. I'm the newly arrived director of the Africa Center as mentioned by Joelle. And I'd like to say just a word or two about the Africa Center for those who are not alumni and familiar with the center. We were chartered by the US Congress more than 20 years ago and we act as a think tank uh, conducting research as well as academic programs related to African security issues and the nexus with the United States as a partner. Our vision is security for all Africans that's championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens. Our website is at www.africacenter.org and I invite you to visit to see the range of research uh, and publications of all kinds that we post and, and make freely available in multiple languages. The program today fits squarely within our vision and our methodology, which involves dialogue, peer learning, and catalyzing strategic solutions. It's my further pleasure this morning to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Bankoli Adeyoye, the AU Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace, and Security. Ambassador Bankole almost needs no introduction, but I will do so all the same as a Pan-African career diplomat with more than three and a half decades of experience. And today he's joining us uh, where he is overseeing democracy in action in the form of uh, being present in Kenya for the Kenyan elections. Ambassador Bankole assumed his office as the African Union Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security in March of 2021 following his election during the 34th AU summit. Immediately prior to this appointment, he was serving as Nigeria's permanent representative to the African Union, uh, as well as ambassador to Ethiopia and uh, Djibouti. His wealth of diplomatic experience spans postings from uh, Cairo uh, to Brasilia, from Pretoria to Addis, I think we can safely say he has covered all, all uh, directions of the compass when it, when it comes to the African continent and beyond. Ambassador Bancoli's core areas of specialty include the nexus between good governance, peace, security, and sustainable development. With that, as a brief introduction, let me now turn to Ambassador Bancoli for a few opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Africa Center for Strategic Studies, the Special Envoy on Youth of the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. As you said, democracy in action, I'm really addressing you from Nairobi, 
where we are waiting with bitter breath for the outcome of the elections. So far, uh, so good. Let me also express my, my sincere and profound pleasure in addressing you. As I see here in Kenya, not just the intergenerational configuration of voters, but also the number of youth as election observers and election officers. What is clear is the conduct of elections and the posturing of, of voters has been highly exemplary. We are confident that, that with the results being announced in few hours or days, Africa will continue to march towards consolidating democracy. Let me join you first in celebrating the Youth Day. It is with a sense of pride and encouragement that African youth can continue to help build the necessary reform that will shape a new continent, a new Africa. I will also commend organizers, particularly the African Center for Strategic Studies and the Youth Envoy of the AU Chairperson Commission, most importantly, all the youth in Africa and beyond because of the totality of their existence, their experiences, knowledge, and in building contemporary societies will show that they represent the future. And the future, as they say, is now. Dear participants, let me also em emphasize that the framework for the expression of Africa's commitment to implement and promote the Youth for Peace strategy gives us the imperative to take into cognizance the global, continental, and regional and national aspirations for the youth. The African Union, as you know, has come up with the African Union, uh, Youth Chapter, the United Nations resolutions on the Youth for Peace and Security, including the Resolution 2250 of 2015. And this has continued to promote global interests in a place for multilateral players, development partners, civil society, the youth to contribute to peace and security at all levels. The African Union and regional bodies are currently engaged in promoting and advocating and campaigning for regional strategies in their national action plans to promote peace and security. It is for this reason that I'm very pleased to point out that, that a key goal of what we do is to promote and encourage intergenerational dialogue between and amongst member states at ministerial and youth levels. It is necessary to, to push for the essence of mainstreaming youth into peace and security architecture at national and continental levels. Ladies and gentlemen, the African Union Peace and Security Council has held several sessions dedicated to the theme of youth peace and security. It is committed to promote the normative frameworks, including the Continental Program on Youth for Peace and the guidelines that have been set up to ensure that the recognition and the value and the contributions of the youth to peace and the security agenda of the African Union remains top priority. It is for this reason that we are very pleased to inform that a continental dialogue series was held in Burundi in April 2020. This was under the leadership of the president of Burundi, cabinet ministers, and the chair of the African Union Peace and Security Council. The Bujumbura Declaration, subsequently adopted by the Peace and Security Council, is a document 
of reference for intergenerational dialogue. It is for this reason that I'm pleased to assure you that the Peace and Security Council has committed to engage with youth in various formats and ensure that the youth voice resonates when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to experience sharing, and the nexus between peace, security, and sustainable development. Let me conclude by highlighting the progressive elements of the Africa's Youth for Peace agenda. As you are aware, as you may be aware, the African Union has appointed youth ambassadors to work with the Office of the Youth Envoy to promote the African Youth for Peace agenda. The five youth ambassadors representing the five regions of the African Union continue to build bridges between the youth and policymakers, particularly in peacemaking, peace building, and in some cases, peace enforcement. It is for this reason that we are committed to partnering with the youth in the Department of Political Affairs, Peace and Security, given that the youth are smart, they are action-oriented, they are dedicated, and they are resilient in today's world. The world we live today is dangerous. We are facing, we are facing on our continent like never before the challenges of terrorism, violent extremism, radicalization, which in both sides affect the youth, sometimes as perpetrators and sometimes as victims. But bringing the youth into the mainstream of addressing peace and security challenges is to build a renewed Africa, an Africa that will be resilient in its communities, in its nation state, regionally, and continentally. We have to build a peaceful and secure Africa together. We have to build a well-governed Africa. We have to build a prosperous continent. The youth must remain the centerpiece of the new Africa. I thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Ms. Dori, and thank you, Ambassador Bankole. Uh, let me introduce the objectives for uh, this webinar. Uh, in this webinar, uh, we hope to examine one, uh, the youth uh, bulge as a mega trend affects peace and security in Africa. We'll assess the state of current continental, regional, national and local commitment to including youth in uh, building peace and providing security in African countries. We'll identify lessons learned and promising practical approaches for strengthening youth to realize their potential in preventing violence and sustaining peace and security in Africa. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the five African Youth Ambassadors for Peace. Uh, Mr. Acheleke Christian Aleke, Ms. Diana Chando, Ms. Uh, Kulud Banguri, Ms. Cynthia Chiwenga, and Mr. Mohamed Kunta. We highly appreciate them for their contribution and for joining us today. They're online with us today, and so we really appreciate their their commitment and their contribution. Let me introduce our panelists. I am pleased to welcome three highly regarded experts who help us develop the objectives that are shared based on their wealth of knowledge and experience. You have their full biographies on the webinar's website and also pasted into the Zoom chat. So I'll just highlight a few pertinent points about each of them here. Let me start with uh, Ms. Chido Cleo Mpemba. Uh, Ms. Chido Mpemba is the Special Envoy on Youth appointed by the Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Uh, Ms. Chido has worked with various institutions to coordinate activities focused on social equity, peace, security, and policy advocacy. She is a Mandela Washington Fellow who was selected under President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. She also participated as a speaker and a catalyst in the Africa Center's most recent flagship program, namely Emerging Security Sector Leader Seminar for the year 2022. She has strong private sector experience, uh, having started her career as a banker and had started a chartered bank for seven years. She holds an MBA degree from Midland State University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Cape Town. 
Our second panelist, uh, Dr. Olawale uh, Ishmael, has over 18 years experience of carrying our research on security, peace, and development issues globally, uh, and in Africa in particular. He has a track record in undertaking research and publication and policy engagements on youth, peace, and security issues. He holds a PhD in peace studies from the University of Bradford and an MPhil in international relations from the University of Cambridge. And he's currently a senior lecturer at the African Leadership Center, King's College, London. And our third panelist, uh, Ms. Munenazo Kujeke, joined the Institute of Security Studies in 2016 and is currently a research officer with the Peace Operations and Peace Building Program. Uh, her area of focus is African youth in governance, peace and security processes. Uh, Mune Nadzo has previously worked for African Union Commission. She holds a master's degree in peace and governance. We're delighted uh, to have the three of you on this panel today. Uh, let me start with, uh, with Chido. Uh, Chido, uh, based on your experience uh, working as the African Union AU Youth Envoy, uh, could you please highlight the major security challenges faced by the young people in Africa and the drivers of these challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chuo. Such a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll just speak briefly based on my experience being in this role for the past eight months. And in short, uh, you know, I've uh, represented and engaged with young people across the continent. And I've had a peek into some of the security challenges, plugging communities, particularly the youth. And in addition to this, I'm working with my, my, my dear colleagues, the African Union Youth Peace Ambassadors that are joining me in this call with regards to their technical expertise and the experience representing the various regions. So uh, some of the challenges we're faced with vary from political tensions. We also have uh, challenges with armed conflicts, ethnic divisions, inequality, poverty, and unemployment, including other emerging issues such as terrorism and even post-COVID-19. And when instability heightens, it threatens the overall security and well-being of societies. And if we look at this, the bulge that we have and the youth bulge constituting approximately over 65% of the continent, it means that more and more young people directly, directly experience the burdensome effects of these challenges. If we look at it into more detail, we can consider terrorism and forced displacement. Um, insecurity and terrorist activities have internally displaced more than 700,000 people. To give a few examples, even in the Cabo uh, Delgado community, with most of them being children, women, and youth. And yet the continent already has about one third of the world refugee population, which is over 30 million IDPs, asylum seekers, and refugees. And majority of that population requiring humanitarian assistance being the youth. Secondly, such issues also increase, also have the risk of, of hunger and food insecurity. If we look at it between 2019 and 2020 alone, 46 million more people face hunger in Africa. And you know, there's been sporadic increases in food insecurity that remain a challenge in various places that we can look at. And according to the World Food Program, conflicts and violent extremism have driven up hunger in most areas leaving more than 950,000 people facing severe hunger in affected areas and 50% of displaced young people and children facing chronic malnutrition. And all these creative, sorry, all these create a, a vicious cycle and compound to form a humanitarian crisis, which exacerbates the insecurity. But more importantly, the challenge is core for cooperation, you know, cooperation between member states that we need to really, really look at, um, you know, to, to, to combat violent extremis extremism, which is spreading across the regions. And uh, thirdly, even if we look at the challenges that are further driven by climate shifts, the movements and forced displacement. If we look in the southern part of the continent, several humanitarian issues have risen, have arisen, and mainly around um, you know, food, drought, and cyclones, leading to displacement. And in the process of the movement and finding secure spaces, young people are then met with horrors of terrorist group activities and attacks too. If we look even within the Western and Central Africa, where you know, we have a, a protected war with terrorism, climate change, drought, and poverty, with countries facing either political instability or terrorist, terrorist attacks. And we must also not forget that young women, girls, and those with disabilities face the brunt of these security challenges as well. 
whilst climate shocks as well trigger movements and threaten peace and security, the resulting effects include a rise in inter and intra community violence, sexual ex exploitation, human trafficking, and other forms of crime. And you know, due to poor livelihoods and challenges of displacement, young people have reportedly been exposed to exploitation and recruitment by terrorist groups, especially in you know, various parts of the region across the continent. And this vulnerability of the youth further fuels the existing peace and security challenges. Lastly, I think other related problems um, include structural challenges, such as the lack of representation and limited participation of youth in peace and security decision-making processes or humanitarian issues. We see the results of this when young people feel unheard and disgruntled, thus the increased social upheals in, in, you know, in various parts of the continent. And if you look at Southern Africa, where youth have taken to the streets to protest, but are met with resistance and with violence. And young people are a useful resource that um, you know, must be meaningfully included in peace and security decisions, policy frameworks, and accountability mechanisms. They are part of the solution to combat the security challenges and must be rightfully given the voice. And um, in conclusion, if you may allow me to also acknowledge, um, as you know, we've, we've acknowledged the presence of the African Union Youth Peace Ambassadors, my fellow colleagues and peer youth leaders, and um, give them an opportunity, um, you know, just to also intervene in, ter in terms of, you know, in case they would like to, 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 to contribute from a regional perspective and their experience being on the ground. Yeah. I think uh, you, you raised a good point on youth board, and I think I want to go to uh, to, uh, to uh, next to uh, uh, Dr. Olawale with uh, the issue of youth board. Uh, based on your research, Dr. W uh, Olawale, can you please explain to our audience uh, what we mean by youth uh, uh, board? Uh, Chido touched on it a little bit, but I think you can also uh, give us a quick explanation from uh, from your research and discuss how the youth board is a continental mega trend that affects peace and security in Africa, and also provide uh, provide some data and evidence to illustrate it if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Chido, for, uh, for the background on that. Uh, generally, when we, uh, the academic and also the policy debate on youth bulge, uh, it simply means when you have a high proportion of the population being within the youth range. Uh, statistically, Africa has a population of about 1.2, 1.3 billion uh, at the moment. Uh, the things, you know, when youth bulge means when the adult population, people age over 15 years, when within that age range, when young people, youth who are between age 15 to 24, when they uh, make up at least 40% of the adult population. So from people age 15 and above, if within that age range, the people that are aged between 15 to 24, some use 29, if they constitute 40% of that adult population, then a country is said to, to have a youth bulge. Uh, statistically, Africa's uh, the signifiers of youth bulge in Africa, when you look at the fertility rate, Africa has uh, between 4.4 to 4.6 live birth per woman, compared to about two live birth per woman globally. Um, and then the rate of population increase in Africa uh, is around 2.6, 2.7%, you know, annually compared to about 1% globally. So Africa's population is increasing, is currently 1.2, 1.3 billion. By the end of this century, Africa's population is projected to reach nearly 11 billion. Uh, between now and 2050, the world population is going to increase uh from what it is now uh currently the world population is around 7.7 7.8 billion now by 2050 the world population is going to add about 2 billion to what we have today 53 percent of that increase is going to come from africa out of the 36 countries in the world that are experiencing youth bulge 31 of them are in africa and that is not the end of the story. Uh, the peak, the increase, the proportional increase in the number of young people is not expected to peak in many African countries until at least 2030, meaning for another eight to 10 years, that exponential increase is going to continue. Now, 
these numbers has created a panic, it has created a concern for a variety of reasons. Those who are looking at this population dynamic, and they are also looking at the incidence of and prevalence of armed conflict and all types of violence in Africa, they've sought to make a connection or they've tried to interrogate whether there is a connection between this population dynamic and the risk or prevalence of uh, violent conflict uh, in Africa. And they make the connection in a number of ways. Of course, the debate is not new. Far back in the 1990s, article of papers by Kaplan and picked up by Collier, Henry Cordell, and a few other academics attracted policy attention as to why Africa experienced you know, exponential rise in cases of armed conflict in the 1990s. The debate has come back or is coming back now because one, the population increase I've spoken about is a lot more uh, dynamic now than it was in the 1990s. Secondly, is the perennial challenge of all kinds of violence in, in Africa that we are having. Now, those that make the connection, they, there are quite a number of things, but I'll talk about the key issues they flag in that connection. The first thing they said is that the population dynamic, birth rate, you know, death rate, rates of population growth, fertility rate, the age structure and distribution of the population, and the movement, migration, urbanization, that all of these things affect the risk of, of violence. And they say that countries with large youth cohort, more or less those with youth bulge, they have a higher risk of uh, violent conflict because one, it leads to higher resource uh, uh, consumption per capita. It leads to ash competition for natural resources, especially renewable fresh water and uh, per capita cropland. They talk about this leading to higher unemployment and higher unemployability of young people. It leads to urbanization and all the chaos associated with urbanization. It leads to higher dependency, you know, dependency ratio, lower savings, lower investment, underdevelopment, poverty, and then you know, this leads to you know, grievances and the rest. Um, this is the summary of how they've, they've linked it. There are quite a number of other you know, things. I don't want to go too deep into that debate, but these are the key uh, issues that they've, they've raised. Can this be true? Is this true for Africa? Does this explain armed conflict and violence that we are seeing in Africa? In my view, I think we need to interrogate, we need to question, uh, and I dare say we need to reject uh, some of these. And I think we can reframe the debate that what does this youth you know, population, this population dynamic, what does it, you know, what opportunities does it bring to Africa? In as much as, we are having you know, challenges with violence and armed conflict, but we're also seeing other things on the continent. From an academic point of view, we can puncture, we can question a number of assumptions linked to those who are seeking to correlate population dynamics in Africa with armed conflict. But I think it's important that we should emphasize that one, young people in Africa are the biggest victims of armed conflict and violence in Africa young people's future have been mortgaged by armed conflict. In all countries where, you know, uh, in countries where armed conflicts have taken place on the continent, young people, uh, the number of young people associated with armed conflict is usually not more than 1% of the youth population. The 99% of young people don't participate in conflict in Africa. They are not violent. So we should stop stereotyping young people in Africa as, you know, a risk of you know, violence. Rather, they are a risk Rather, the opportunities for transformation for change on the continent. Secondly, it's also the fact that young people, and this has been emphasized by you know recent policy pronouncement by the UN under Resolution 2250 and 2419, the AU, uh, you know YPS agenda also emphasized this: is that young people are the biggest promoters of peace in Africa. Who who builds peace in Africa? It's not the government. It is not the peacekeepers. It is not peace, of, you know, peace operation. It is the people. And in communities, in local communities, down, you know, up and down Africa, it is young people in these communities that are promoting peace, that are building peace silently without making too much noise about it. So rather than being a risk of conflict, 
young people are actually asset for peace in Africa. Third is that we are beginning to see that young people are changing Africa from below, from between and above. They are changing Africa from within the continent, from outside the continent. You know, they are changing Africa in non or let me say less violent ways. So we, we and, and, and they are putting Africa on the global map. They are developing new brands in music and art, in fashion, in entertainment, in creative industries. They are adding to the GDP of many African countries. I mean, young people are doing so much for Africa, so we need to rephrase the debate. In as much as this webinar is about interrogating it, I think you know we can do a lot more to begin to challenge the orthodox assumptions about young people and violent conflict in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lawale. I think this is a very good start for us to uh, start challenging some of the assumptions and debate that, that uh, or uh, perspective about young people as, uh, as uh, most uh, scholars would say a time bomb. I think I'm gonna move quickly to uh, uh, my uh, other colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Mudinazo, uh, to give us also uh, from her research, uh, she's coming from ISS, uh, if she can share with us some of the status and level of implementation of the African Union Youth, uh, Youth Peace and Security Agenda, particularly youth participation in the security sector. And uh, also, if you can also make some reference to Chido's uh, 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 you know, discussion on some of the key components uh, behind the AU continental framework. Over to you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Joel. Um, I was very excited to actually listen to Dr. Wale and, uh, and Chido speak because I feel like they gave a very good background on what I'm about to speak on. So in, in terms of judging the status and level of implementation by the African Union on its uh, youth peace and security agenda right now, I think we should start off by stating that it's actually in a teething phase. This is an agenda that was formally introduced in 2018 with the formation of the Youth for Peace Africa program. Now that's not to say that the AU never concentrated on issues relating to youth peace and security. I mean, from as far back as the 2006, um, Youth Charter, they were talking about, I think Article 17 or so, talking about youth inclusion uh, in peace processes to some degree. So if anything, this formal agenda that speaks directly to youth peace and security is in its teething phase. And before that, um, I think most African states were concentrating on what came from the UN since 2015, uh, when the resolutions started coming in. So right now, and also because of the COVID pandemic, I feel that the African Union hasn't really scratched the surface. There were a lot of disturbances, uh, but we must um, applaud them for what they have done in terms of getting young people talking peace and security. They've introduced these youth ambassadors for peace. And if anything, they make young people, especially young peace builders in member states feel like they do have some sort of um, mouthpiece within the AU system to talk about their grievances and also project their ideas on how to actually push the agenda forward. Uh, but one other thing to actually, um, you know, to bring to the table is that when we talk about the level of implementation, some of us tend to pin this against uh, the WPS agenda because we say, okay, these are two agendas representing vulnerable communities, marginalized communities. But I feel like the implementation for youth peace and security has been very challenging. Most people say it's because it's a transitional phase in people's lives, it's not permanent. So most people are not taking it seriously, but we're beginning to see that with the African Union stepping in with its Youth for Peace Africa program, there's been a bit of progress. And when tracking the implementation, what we track against, it's its 10-year uh, implementation plan that was launched in 2020. And this is an implementation plan that is pinned on the continental framework on youth peace and security. And it comes with certain targets of how they would envision uh, this youth peace and sec security agenda moving forward. For instance, they want by 2024, to have capacitated at least 250 young peace builders on the continent. And they're in the direction, you know, in doing that, despite the, you know, the slowdown brought by the pandemic, they are really headed to actually making sure that happens. And then in terms of national action plan development, for instance, they want to have 25% of AU member states having national action plans. And so far it's just Nigeria that has a national action plan. So that in that regard, implementation has been slow, but we're starting to see a lot of conversations picking up on that. But um, if anything, we should actually 
um, look at the levels of implementation as being something that depends on the political will of AU member states themselves and how they wish to actually move their youth forward within this agenda. And the level of trust between these governments and their own youth-led CSOs or young peace builders in general. And also the resources allocated uh, to this agenda are quite critical, both human and uh, financial. They tend to slow down the implementation. A lot of young people from uh, the study that we did with the African Union in 2020. A lot of young people actually participate in youth peace and security um, activities on a voluntary basis. There's less funding in that. And at times that slows down the implementation because young people still need to earn a living. So it, it ends up being a part-time thing for some young people, but that is actually slowly changing. Thank you. Thank you, Mune. I think uh, you kind of brought, uh, you know, uh, everything that uh, Chido and then Dr. Olawale uh, said uh, in the beginning, and I think we're, we're on a good start. But I think I want to give a, a minute uh, or two minutes to uh, uh, the youth ambassadors to also share some of the perspectives. You know, I know Chido, Chido highlighted the, uh, uh, that they, they're doing some great work you know, in their regions, and I think it would be good to hear from them what, what are some of the perspectives coming from, uh, from the regions. So I'll give the floor to uh, uh, Ms. Cynthia. Uh, she will start first, and then we'll go to uh, Ms. Kolod. Uh, to, to give us uh, their perspective on what's happening in their region. Uh, Cynthia, over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joel, and thanks to, to Chido and Mune and Dr. Wale. I was scribbling throughout their presentations because I really related to most of the issues um, that they mentioned. Uh, Mune obviously working with ISS in Southern Africa and then Chido being our youth envoy and really advocating for, for the YPS agenda um, to the African Union and, and different stakeholders. Uh, one of the, the, the aspects that I'll touch on from my previous, uh, from, my, from my experience as a youth ambassador for Peace for Southern Africa is, is one of the issues that um, Dr. Wale mentioned, which is on, on stereotyping young people in Africa. And this is one of the conversations that we have been having uh, as part of the Youth for Peace Africa program. And one of the coordinators, Dr. Ako, um, says that the conversation about um, youth peace and security should, um, should not just uh, be based on the population dynamics, but should transcend that and actually look at the value that young people are bringing. And that helps in, in, in sort of demystifying some of the stereotypes that we have. And there was reference that was made to young people leading uh, in terms of brands, in terms of music, we've seen collaborations, different artists from Nigeria to South Africa to Zimbabwe. And that's really reflective of the innovations that we could have. And, and these are some of the young people we actually need to bring to the, uh, to the next ACSS uh, conversation. Send an invitation to Burner Boy. Let's, let us have him here because he's the person that young people are listening to. And then we can start using that creativity and the innovation into the, into the YPS agenda. And then finally, uh, Mune mentioned the importance of funding and that most people participate um, on a voluntary basis. And this is what we have seen also, I think, being a, a, one of the administrators of the Youth Peace and Security Network for Southern Africa, where we have over 260 youth-led um, initiatives and representatives um, engaging with us. You see that these are people who are engaging at a, at a voluntary basis, and that becomes a challenge, especially in a context where um, conflict is also incentivized. And I think in one of the engagements we had um, in Harare last week on, on developing national action plans on youth peace and security in Southern Africa, someone mentioned that those who actually promote peace must be as well organized as those who promote violence and, and conflict. So there's really need for um, more funding to go into the space. And we hope the stakeholders that are represented here will be, will be giving us some of their money after the conference. But um, overall, um, despite the challenges that have been mentioned, the stereotypes and, and some of the challenges, I think this has been a very fulfilling experience. Um, and as much as there are challenges, there are also opportunities to engage, to actually work with young people in my region, in Mozambique, for instance, which is one of the, the recommendations that Mune has uh, partnered with young people, train them, capacitate them, go beyond um, conflict interventions, but ask them, why did you participate in this, in this um, insurgency group? Why are you joining extremist groups? And I think once we have that multi-dimensional approach, then we are at a better chance to, 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 to reach a, a global peace and peace in Africa and, and the world. 
So these are some words for me and th from me and thank you so much for this opportunity and to the panelists for highlighting um, some of the challenges and opportunities we experience as youth ambassadors for peace. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I think uh, you, uh, you, you've created uh, some, uh, even added uh, more, more fuel to the debate. And I think uh, I'm gonna pick back again on, uh, on, on Chido to see uh, if she has any, uh, any, any addition to that, especially if you can also highlight some of the AU from, uh, from your point of view, some of the AU commitments to address some of the, the issues that uh, our colleague Cynthia mentioned, especially some of the challenges that the, the young people in Africa uh, are facing within the, the YPS uh, agenda. Over to you again, uh, uh, Chido. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Roots, and uh, sorry, thank you, thank you, Dr. Jewel, and and to my colleagues as well for that intervention. And I definitely agree in terms of the challenges that you know young people are faced with. Also, being a young person myself, but now speaking uh, with regards to the perspective from from the African Union and some of the commitments that the African Union has made in this regard, I think I'll start off when we speak about Agenda 2063. When we look at Aspiration Four, it talks about a peaceful and secure Africa, and having said that. It's something that we then have to aspire to and in recognition of the youth bulge that is expected to continue growing um, you know, throughout the remainder of the 21st century. And the AU has instituted some of these mechanisms and commitments in this regard. I'll also just you know, maybe touch perhaps briefly you know, on, on some of these um, mechanisms uh, that are being implemented at the African Union, but also just to uh, perhaps, uh, you know, also provide further clarity in terms of our role as the African Union Commission. So the African Union Commission works within the African Union, uh, uh, which is made up of the 55 member states. And part of this process is to ensure that, um, you know, we, we come in to execute um, as well as to work with the member states in terms of implementation of the various mechanisms. So one of the things I'll touch on is the African Union Youth Charter. And this African Union Youth Charter, you know, serves as a strategic framework for the African um, country member states, um, giving direction for youth empowerment and development at the continental, regional and national level. And particularly Article 7, I'm sorry, 17, uh, which emphasizes the role of youth and peace and security. Having said that, this um, African Union Youth Charter was adopted in 2006. And at the moment, we have 17 member states that have not ratified the Youth Charter. And that means that um, within the 17 member states that have not ratified the Youth Charter, you know, it needs to go into parliament and we need the member states to be able to implement this um, in order to ensure that, you know, they recognize, um, you know, um, the role that, you know, young people play when it comes to youth peace and security and that they are fully included in policy making level. And further to this, um, we have the AU Peace and Security Council, which is um, which endorsed the continental um, youth study at the was it the 933rd um, meeting in 2020 to recognize the essential roles and contributions youth make to peace and security in Africa. And as a result of this, you also see, um, you know, I think the commissioner mentioned about the Bujumuru Declaration. And again, this is a space that was created to say that, uh, you know, whilst we have the Peace and Security Council, it also provides an opportunity for young people to contribute in that regard. And, you know, further to this, when you look at the Bujumbura um, Declaration, it was young people that came together uh, through a continental dialogue. And within that, looking at the youth peace and security continental framework, um, you know, as part of recommendations that they were offering to say this is what we need to ensure that um, we zone in on in terms of the challenges we've been faced with, um, you know, when it comes to the framework of, of, of youth peace and security. I'll give one example, you know, if you look at partnerships, which is, you know, one of the, um, you know, uh, mentioned within the YPS um, continental framework, where young people were, you know, talking about challenges we're faced with in terms of, you know, access to, 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 to fund, funding, building capacity, and as well as, you know, the limits that we have with regards to this access to funding then creates and breeds an environment of competition versus collaboration. So now as the African Union, because, you know, we've, we've been, um, you know, on the ground and we, we've heard this, you know, in partnership with, with my peers at the IAPS and PUPS, you know, this then provides an opportunity for us to go back and lobby within the member states, uh, you know, and, 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 and various partners we work with to ensure that, you know, we provide more opportunities for young people. Having said that, uh, perhaps I'll just quickly zone into um, something that, you um, within the Office of Youth Envoy, we've been um, advocating for as an initiative. So, you know, uh, having come into office, um, uh, you know, we, we looked at, you know, the, the, the challenges young people have faced with, and I thought that it was necessary that, you know, I embark on a 60 days youth engagement tour, a listening tour, 
And the purpose of that listening tour was to ensure that in as much as, you know, within the African Union, we can come up with all these instruments, you know, I can provide recommendations and speak on behalf of young people, but I need to hear from the young people themselves. And as part of that 60 days youth engagement tour, you know, we, we, we were visiting um, various countries and specifically using a model which looked at, you know, youth engagement where, you know, we brought young people together within a youth tunnel and uh, also looking at community engagements to ensure that we also include the marginalized communities and those that might not have access to information or you know, access to technology, but also to ensure that their voices are included in terms of some of the challenges they're faced with um, within um, you know, various perspectives. And lastly, looking at political commitments. So the final part of this um, youth engagement tour was to ensure that we get political commitments from member states. So in each and every country that we managed to go to, I'll conclude this with you know, visiting uh, you know, um, government officials and policymakers, just to give them an update to say, look, I was on the ground. And now when we're making these requests on behalf of young people and we're lobbying, it is actually grounded on what young people themselves are saying and what I've seen when I'm visiting these communities and the challenges they're being faced with. And therefore we need those commitments coming from member states to say, what are they gonna do for the young people and how are they going to ensure that we, um, you know, we promote regional cooperation and integration and ensure that when you speak about young people and as an agenda at the African Union, even with regards to the you know, high level events, it's, you know, we, we, we ensure that you know, they're sensitized to some of these issues that young people are really being faced with and we have that buy-in for young people. Um, so, you know, also based on this, you know, uh, we're in the process of finalizing on the report, the publication, as well as the policy brief that will go out uh, as recommendations to member states to, you know, what we think should be done on behalf of the young people. And um, finally, I think um, for the sake of time, maybe I'll just dive on into just two more. Uh, you know, another popular initiative is the Silencing the Guns in Africa Agenda, which was a flagship initiative of the African Union Agenda 2063. And that aspires to end all wars, conflict and gender-based violence and to prevent genocide. And part of this agenda includes mobilizing and promoting youth participation as key agents in ensuring a peaceful um, you know, continent as well. And uh, okay, on the last bit, um, you know, I had the opportunity again, you know, to 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 participate in the Emerging Security Sector Leaders Program, um, you know, at the African Center of Strategic Studies, um, just in in June. And again, this provided an opportunity, really, because you know, uh, part of that program, you know, being one of the youngest people that was there and coming from the African Union, but representing the voices of the young people in the 55 member states, it provided an opportunity to also speak to our security sector leaders, you know, including the 50, uh, was it 35 countries that represented, uh, you know, military forces, police, um, um, the security sector in terms of military forces, police forces, as well as, you know, civilians, but sensitizing them in terms of, you know, um, the youth, uh, the, the African Union Youth Charter, as well as to ensuring that even as they look at their national um, strategies on, on, on peace and security, that it should be inclusive of young people. So again, uh, you know, just being uh, grateful of that opportunity that was provided to ensure that, you know, we speak more about young people and, you know, we build this um, network even within the security sector uh, to ensure that we sensitize them when it comes to, um, you know, youth peace and security in Africa, as well as to ensure that, uh, you know, we, 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 we remove that stigma, you know, that comes honestly when, you know, as a young person myself, um, you know, uh, in terms of dialogue with your security sector leaders, but building together, also looking at the, if you look at the theme for, inter for, for International Youth Day, it talks about, you know, solidarity, intergenerational solidarity for all ages. And I think that will also come in, in terms of how we dialogue and we interact with the security sector and providing um, that opportunity, perhaps even within the African Union for young people to be able to dialogue at, um, you know, country level with the security sector. Yeah. Thank you, Chido. I think you, uh, you you put a lot on the table, and I think uh, you just made the work a little bit harder for uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Wally, and uh, I think uh, you have some defending to do. Uh, Dr. Wally, uh, uh, recent research argues that having, you know, a large proportion of young people in the population, you know, does not automatically uh, lead to instability or conflict. And I think you highlighted a little bit of this. Uh, could you please, you know, take us, you know, to your research, and uh, do you agree with this proposition? Uh, what are some of the evidence showing uh, uh, in terms of uh, violence in Africa? And if anything, if you can relate some of these, you know, uh, conversations that you'll be having with what Chido has said and then what Cynthia said before and said what uh, Mune also said before. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, 
we can interrogate and puncture that assumption that having youth bulge translate into either the risk, heightened risk, or the prevalence of violence in a number of way, ways. One, when you focus on the sheer number of young people, it does not tell you about the composition, the mindset, the orientation, the worldview, the perspective of these young people. So focusing on sheer number of young people ignores the mindset, the worldview, the perspective, the aspirations of these young people. More, moreover, focusing on the number of young people deflects away from the problematic systems of governance in many African countries. Where you have you know, cases of violence and conflict in Africa, there is incontrovertible evidence that violence and conflict in Africa and elsewhere is often linked to systems of resource allocation, resource distribution, you know, intergroup interest, intergroup um, competition, not necessarily about the number of young people in those contexts. In any case, um, war is not peculiar to Africa, armed conflict is not peculiar to Africa, violence is not peculiar to Africa. Different countries have different challenges. So even countries that are not having youth bulges are also experiencing armed conflict, they're also experiencing violence. So violence is not an African disease. Uh, we have to emphasize that. Secondly, many of the data sets that underpin this assumption, we can query them. There are a huge, you know, there are question marks on this data set. How are they looking at young people? How are they defining youth? Who do they see as youth in Africa? Many of these data sets often apply youth to be people aged 15 to 24. But the reality of youth in Africa as emphasized in the African Youth Charter, as emphasized in the African Youth uh, YPS, and in the respective national youth policy document of many African countries. The age classification of youth in Africa is different from, from this. So Africa does not have a 15 to 24 year old problem as you know, we are you know, meant to, to, to believe what means what it means to be a youth in Africa, uh, because youth is a transitional phase. When people are moving, you know, training or learning or wanting to be adult or getting ready to be adult. Because of the peculiarities of Africa, challenges that we have with our education, with labor market access, labor market absorption, and all of these issues that we have, it means that the transition takes longer in, you know, in Africa, in many African contexts, many African uh, countries. So as you know, focusing, telling us that there is, you know, youth in Africa is 15 to 24, is a fallacy. Youth in Africa is, is wider than that. The entry point and the exit point to being a youth in Africa is a lot more elastic, depending on, uh, you know, some countries like Mali and a few other ones have youth up to the age of 40. Some have it up to the age of 38. Some have it up to the age of 35. So, you know, youth is a lot more elastic in, in Africa. In any case, age is not just the only basis upon which people define youth in Africa. Social, cultural norms, you know, culture and other practices also define youth in, in Africa. And then the generalized notion of, you know, youth, sometimes when we talk about youth, we talk about a uniform, we sometimes assume it is a uniform, you know, a linear group. But the reality is there's a lot of internal differentiation and different categories of, of youth. And a lot of, and these different internal differentiation and categories of youth, we need to focus a bit more on it because sometimes when we talk about youth, we use an umbrella term to capture what is essentially a very diverse you know, you know, group of people. And it is that internal dynamic sometimes that also stops young people from being too much involved in violence or engaging you know, in violence. Uh, and we can go a bit more into that. Uh, the one or two other final point to also talk about is, again, they talk about data. Many African countries, there are issues around uh, registration of birth, registration of death, data on, on poverty, on literacy, on unemployment. So many of, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of um, statistical assumptions based on, and I don't want to get too much into, you know, into this, 
but we do know that some of the data out there they are based you know they are the best possible data that we can have does not necessarily mean they reflect the actual reality of you know of of africa and then the old adage that correlation is not causation the fact that africa is experiencing high number of you know young people and violence is high in about the same time at the same pace or in different you know uh rates of increase does not necessarily mean one is is linked or is caused by the other so we we also have to be very careful in not equating that plus there are different varieties of violence different types of violence are caused or are linked to different processes different dynamics so you cannot even talk about the link between youth budget and violence in a linear one way once you know unidirectional we you know you have criminal violence you have violence linked to mass protest about young people wanting transformation and even the process of transformation in society in any way uh, are usually very chaotic and we've seen that in a number of you know in a number of countries within and outside of of africa so coming back to the team that i spoke about earlier on we need to begin to look at the youth budget and the opportunities it gives to africa opportunity for development, opportunity for less violent transformation. The processes of transformation of critical change in society, of getting rid of structural violence in society is never you know, violent, completely violent free or never you know, chaotic. There will be you know, dislocation, there will be new winners, there will be old losers, you know, there will be all of the, and all of these you know, provoke reaction, provoke responses that can bring in some process, you know, some uh, amount of violence. But when we look at the continent in the last 10 years or 20 years, we've seen increasing number of African young people in Africa being grabbed by the global economy who are searching for skilled labor. A lot of young people in Africa are working. I mean, COVID, one of the interesting things about COVID is that young people in Africa are working remotely for global enterprise, for global companies, for global businesses. So Africa is beginning to export this labor, the abundance of labor that it has. Many countries in, you know, in the G7, they have all kinds of visa schemes to bring in skilled labor. UK is doing it, US is doing it, you know, the, you know, Canada is doing it, Australia is doing it, Germany is doing it. Many of these, they are tapping from Africa's abundance of labor. And you know, what does this mean? It means Africa is being integrated a lot more into the global economy by the reality of its youth board. Not just only that, we are beginning to see reverse migration. In the Africans in diaspora, the remittances is now a big issue, a big source of foreign, you know, exchange, foreign inflow into Africa's economy. Not just only that, a lot of ICT companies, Microsoft, Facebook, and the rest, they are beginning to set up ICT hubs in Africa. Why? Because they've seen what is happening. They've seen young people are beginning to incubate solutions for transformation, for change, for efficiency, you know, across Africa. And they are trying to key into this process. Why is that happening? You bulge, you know, is that it? We are also seeing, and I mentioned earlier on, Africa's branding in terms of the creative economy, what it is adding to Africa's GDP, how African brands in music and art and entertainment, and all of these things have implications for peace and security. One, they, you know, they're bringing money into, into the economy. Two, they are creating new career pathways for many young people. That were, those career pathways were not there 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but we, they are now multiplying those career pathways, career opportunities. So the environment that young people find themselves in Africa are no longer necessarily limiting them in terms of their capabilities and their ability to transform their lives and the lives of their families and the lives of their communities and, and countries at, at large. Finally, we've seen mass protests that are forcing out dictators that have been in power. We've seen mass protests to demand for justice, for accountability, for rule of law, for human rights, for you know, credible elections, for democratization, for good governance, for you know, improved service delivery across Africa without necessarily leading to armed conflict. So the fact that you have a high proportion of youth does not mean they are all going to become militia men or take guns or you know, be firing or being recruited to fight in senseless war. We are beginning to see young people taking ownership 
for the processes of changing their society. So, you know, processes of change that are homegrown, that are rooted, that are not externally funded or supported by any way. So young people are taking ownership, exercising leadership across, you know, different African countries in different ways. So we are beginning to see a different outcome to youth bulge, not necessarily armed conflict. How many new civil wars, how many new armed conflict, new in quote, have broken out in Africa in the last 10 years? We begin to ask that. Many of the conflict and I'm, you know, that we are dealing with Africa, many of them are about 10 years old. So no new conflict in that classical sense are breaking out on the continent. What we are beginning to see are processes of transformation, of transforming societies in a way that do not lead to armed conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wale. I think uh, you've uh, again uh, pushed the, the, the boundaries for us to not think about young people as a, a time bomb, but more so of uh, an opportunity uh, for the continent. And I think I'll turn over to our colleague, uh, uh, Mune, uh, to also share some of the positive uh, developments, uh, as well as two major challenges hindering the implementation of, uh, of YPS. And I think I'm putting you in the middle of uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Wale just said. Over to you. All right, thank you so much. I I'm actually more glad to share the positive developments <laughs> than the challenges, but the developments, um, there have been rather few due to a lot of barriers in the past two, three years. But uh, in terms of when we're judging by when uh, the African Union launched its, you know, its official YPS agenda, the, the first development that I can say has been really recorded has been the ability for young people across the continent to now speak about youth peace, peace and security with as if they're looking at one framework in mind because there is a continental framework on youth peace and security. So that is the go-to document that they can look at. I, it was endorsed in uh, 2020. And at the end of the day, they no longer look at documents outside of their continent so that they can refer to, but what do I understand as an African about youth peace and security? But Adding on to that, young people now collaborate. They partner a lot amongst themselves as youth-led CSOs and so forth, because when that um, agenda was rolled out by the African Union, they created these social media groups, especially on WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups for different regions. And I think Cynthia spoke about that previously because these are groups that the IAPs also get to manage. These are full of young peace builders that now get to identify, oh, who's my fellow young peace builder in North Africa, in Central Africa, and so forth, and they get to actually um, collaborate. And we also find National Youth for Peace Africa programs now springing up led by young people. These are not led by government. It's young people taking the initiative themselves. And for me, that's one thing that I can say is good and has been recorded as something that is an effect of uh, the African Union taking this seriously. And then um, the second thing, and I think it's on everyone's mouth right now, is Nigeria taking the lead and being the first African country to develop national action plans for youth peace and security. And I think it's the second in the world. And if anything, someone had to do it, Nigerian youth did it and they led it. It's not that government led it for them. And I think they had great support from the African Union, but um, one thing that we now have to look forward to so that this positive development can really be cemented is that we now need other African states to replicate the same. We were in Harare, I think two weeks ago, and the Minister of Youth, um, Zimbabwe's Minister of Youth actually said, oh, okay, we need to get serious on this, Zimbabwe might be the second. So if anything, it's about young people pushing their governments, working with their national youth councils, working with their youth ministries to make sure that they develop these national action plans because you cannot have a continental framework without a roadmap or a plan. So that's the second step. And in terms of major challenges, I think it's, it's known by everyone that COVID-19 really affected the agenda. It had just been launched. But um, a major thing of this interference is that young people, especially the young peace builders on the continent, they really relied on human interactions. I think there's an eye up in the room, Christian Achaleke. In Cameroon, his work involves going around, you know, in communities, meeting people, talking about his work and so forth. Things like that could not work because of the pandemic. And if anything, young people were at the forefront of their own work contributing to the agenda. They were very affected. And also their funding, their funding became you know, less reliable, less predictable. And it really scared them in terms of how do they move forward in contributing to this. And then another challenge, which is quite contemporary, and people are still figuring out how to sort this out, is the unconstitutional changes in government. 
because this has happened, right? We have Mali, we have Guinea. And then when you bring it to the youth prison security context, that means that there's this shrinking space for young people to actually engage in these issues. They are now uncertain of, okay, where the governance process is taking us. Is democracy going to be, you know, it's, is it going to be a shield for me? Is, going to sh is it going to shield my work? So if anything, that has brought in some sort of major challenge that we are yet to tackle, but I know that the African Union is actually trying to take time out to concentrate on this and hopefully young people will not be at the forefront of, you know, being used um, by, you know, certain politicians and so forth. But then at the end of the day, they have to be at the center of solutions for this. Thank you so much, Mune. I think uh, you've again uh, brought in a, a few, uh, 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 you know, a few examples and also uh, some of the challenges that young people are facing and then also some of the new develop positive developments. And I think it would be also good to hear from our colleague, uh, uh, Kalud, who is one of the youth ambassadors for peace uh, for Tunisia. And I think I think I would like to bring Tunisia and uh, North Africa also into the debate to see what's happening in that, in that part of uh, uh, Africa. Over to you, Kalud. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cho. Um, and good afternoon, uh, distinguished excellencies and distinguished guests. Uh, thank you for your granting us the space to speak and to represent uh, our regions. Uh, I would like to thank Chido also for uh, acknowledging us. Uh, she has been uh, doing such a great job in supporting our mandate as youth ambassadors. Uh, it's very important for me to reflect on the challenges uh, from my region, North Africa, that youth are facing today. And I can highlight a couple. Uh, taken from unemployment to corruption to political instability, and the list goes on. But I would like to just, uh, in bullet points, highlight the most uh, important issues that we are facing in the region. Now, uh, we have been seeing varying forms of violence that are also a major factor uh, that threats the well-being of youth uh, and leading uh, their peace-building uh, initiatives or uh, activities in the region. And uh, they are trying to find and create and still actually looking for avenues to promote uh, peace and effective governance and reform. So they are demanding reform and great political openness and inclusivity because political uh, openness is very important in the North African context. When you invite the youth to be actively um, engaged in politics, you are granting them also an opportunity to express themselves and you are uh, eliminating the structural barriers that uh, in a way or another uh, presented a challenge, uh, pre-revolutionary regimes and still ongoing actually. Now, if you talk about the unemployment issues, there, the, the staggering rates and the widespread dissatisfaction uh, with the government performances and responded to these challenges actually um, create a, a frustration for youth in a way or another. And these frustrations may be interpreted in tensions, manifestations, and in other contexts, other violent, uh, other violent actions. Uh, so in the midst of these uh, transitions, some behavioral deterioration will be observed which we actually seen in the last years. And that's sort of a language of despair that youth speak up. And through our mandate as youth ambassadors for peace, we are trying to eliminate these approaches. We are actually inviting youth to go through peaceful and a more positive approach while advocating for their uh, positive role as uh, active change makers. Uh, we cannot go through the North African context without definitely highlighting the issue of migration. Uh, the brain drain, the illegal migration that is more likely to go to flagrant numbers if the government is unable to create more job opportunities. Because uh, if we like it or not, there is a direct link between the migration and the employment, the unemployment issue. Uh, migration also is, uh, is driven by the economic instability and climate change factors uh, that is pushing uh, for youth to migrate. You, who are considered the drivers of economic well-being and economic growth for uh, Tunisia uh, specifically. So um, that being said, I would, uh, I would also like to highlight the PSC session where we were officially endorsed, where I highlighted the issue of uh, migration and that was adapted by the PS, uh, PSC verbatim. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the role of the Peace and Security Council. Uh, in adapting the youth vision, which is a milestone, I think, that, uh, for youth to be incorporated in the peace and security outcome uh, communique, that is really important. So these kind of um, 
uh, adapt adoptions and these kind of uh, support that we see from member states and stakeholders, we really want to see it more in other species and we really want it to see in all over the regions. I definitely agree with Mune in, in, in when she mentioned about duplicating the best practices and for you to push the member states on implementing international action plans. And, um, and what is really better is that we saw a live example in Abuja, Nigeria, which is the first country to adapt its national action plan on youth peace and security. So for me, a person coming from North Africa, to see that there's already uh, an implementation of this uh, plan and to see that youth are being incorporated in peace and security, it only gives me a motivation to mobilize and to advocate on how we as youth can be incorporated and push our member states in North Africa to actually incorporate us both in the design and the implementation phases. I also appreciated the intervention of uh, Mr. Wale when he spoke about ownership and uh, youth exercising leadership. This is actually what we are trying to promote also as youth ambassadors. Basically, through our mandate, we are promoting and advocating for uh, a positive role of youth as peace builders. But we cannot do that on our own. We definitely call for stakeholders and member states to engage us and to support our initiatives because we're also uh, being the bridge between the youth in our regions and um, the African Union and the other member states. So with that being said, I say that there's an urge to keep up with the needs and concerns of the increasing young population, and it's about time that we uh, keep on pushing for youth to be invited to peace building dialogues. Thank you so much, um, and I'll take it over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kolo. Thank you to our panelists uh, for their excellent insights on these critical uh, topics. And, and thank you to all who are following online and uh, uh, the conversation. And I hope you found this kind of interactions uh, very helpful. And we'll now move on to a, a Q&A again session where we'll continue to record the meeting. So the questions are, do you think the youth uh, demographic uh, demographics are perceived? How, how do you think the, the youth demographics are perceived in your country? Uh, are they, you know, perceived positively, negatively, or are you neutral about it? And and the second question is, uh, do you feel included uh, in the decision making processes in your country? And then uh, we have a third question: Are the priorities of African youth and African government aligned? Uh, and and uh, at least with the second question, we're seeing that you know uh, we have a, a majority saying somewhat, uh, you, you know, they they feel included in the decision-making decision process in the country. And on the last question, are the priorities of youth and African government aligned? I, I think uh, we have a, a split. Uh, some are saying somewhat and some are saying no. And uh, on, on the yes, uh, we see that we have uh, uh, only a few people saying that they are aligned. And I think it, it raises some few uh, fundamental questions that I think we'll, we'll, we'll start asking. And I think I'll give uh, each of the panelists maybe two minutes to address one question that has been burning. Uh, in regards to this, you know, uh, uh, several governments are exploring, you know, national service programs as a method to empower young people. And the idea is to instill, you know, national values, apply, you know, youth energy and capacity building to peace and security in both remote and urban areas, you know, and, and, and I think it would be good to have your reaction. I think that's something that, you know, you alluded to before that uh, we need to empower young people, but governments are doing some things and I think it would be good to hear your, your thoughts on that. So I'll start this time around with, uh, with, with Mune and then I'll finish with, uh, with, 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 uh, with Chido. Over to you, Mune. All right, thank you, Dr. Joel. As I understand your question, you want me to comment about uh, national programs by governments and how they can beef up YPS? Yes, that's correct. So national governments are doing, uh, so in some places they're calling national uh, service programs for youth. And, and in a way to you know, empower them to uh, and instill values in, uh, in, in, in making sure that they are involved in peace building and, 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 and sustaining peace, if you can comment on that. All right. Well, you know, it's, it's really not new for African states to do that. And it's been con you know, commendable. I, I know in Nigeria, it's also happening and so forth. Um, at the end of the day, you become more patriotic, I think. First and foremost, that's that's um, how how it's meant to be. But sorry to sound quite negative, but there are other instances where 
you know, the components of these uh, national youth programs are very military in nature or very aligned to ruling parties. And it ends up being a tool for young people to actually, you know, be streamlined into what does the ruling party expect. So it, it's it's a 50-50 thing. I feel like if it's designed, the programs of um, the curricula of these programs, if, if they're designed in an inclusive manner, they could actually work to the benefit of young people. But at the end of the day, it's after high school, before you go to university, you're part of this program for one year. And I understand in some countries, you need that certificate to gain employment. But if we start, you know, getting governments talking youth peace and security, giving some sort of classes or modules on it, maybe we can use it to the benefit of the agenda. But from my experience and my research, and I've done research on this on Zimbabwe, it has, it has not led to beefing up agendas like the youth peace and security agenda. Thank you, Monet. And I'll give uh, some chance to, uh, I, I know you specifically uh, highlighted uh, Nigeria, so I'll give a uh, chance to Dr. Olawale uh, uh, to, to say a few words. I'm not sure if he was part of the youth, uh, National Youth Service, but it would be good to hear from you. I, 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 I am, and I'm an alumnus, a proud one for that matter of that program. I had my, in Nigeria, where you finish, you know, um, university or your bachelor's, you know, that's when you're expected to do it. And I think I had my 99, 1999. Um, three things to say. One is that, there has been no serious evaluation of these programs in relation to their conflict prevention or otherwise, or peace building. But in the case of Nigeria, has the longest history of countries with, with this. Nigeria introduced its own in the 70s after the Civil War as a way of promoting national cohesion, as a way of promoting reconciliation, and as a way of allowing young people from you know, for you to go around the country because the program takes you to another part of the country for you to be exposed to the diversity of the country to appreciate the diversity of it. And I, uh, from anecdotal, you know, anecdotal evidence that are available, a lot of people because of that program, after, you know, serving in another part of the country, they stayed back, they married other people, you know, into other tribes or they married from other tribes. Many set up businesses and residency and that has promoted, um, you know, to, to some extent it has, you know, helped to cement the diversity of the country and generations of young people continue to go through that program. So I think there are many positives for that program based on anecdotal evidence that we have. But, and this is a big but, that program, we, we need to look at the content of it. And I think that is where, you know, uh, Mune, you know Muneazo was, was talking about. Uh, a few other countries, Ghana has introduced one, Sri alone, maybe Kenya as well. A few other countries, I think about six or seven countries in Africa now, you know, who are trying to, to do this. Is that necessarily the best way to uh, popularize the YPS agenda to provide opportunities and training for young people in conflict prevention, in mediation, in nonviolence, to empower them. Yes and no. It can it can help, but I think for us to really make the progress that Africa deserves in the YPS agenda to really empower young people, we need to deepen the message of it. I would want a situation where the YPS is integrated into educational curriculum right from even elementary school up to high, you know, high school. As part of, you know, uh, courses we call, you know, GPS or, you know, general, you know, courses in university. You don't have, it's not until you finish and you go for a program that you, you should begin to learn or know or participate or advance the course of YPS. So there are a lot more effective, a lot more embedded ways that we can mainstream the YPS and its message and its objectives into the lives of young people uh, earlier on and throughout the course of their YouTube. Then the final thing to say is that the YPS agenda itself is not a government owned, it's not AU owned or ECOWAS or any UN owned. One thing we have to accept that the Africa youth of today are unlike the you know, youth of any previous decades that Africa has had. The process of change, the ownership of these processes are 
owned by young people are owning these processes. They are shaping these processes. There is a former YPS, which is being coordinated by the AU. We have the youth ambassadors and all of that. But there is also the, the original, the, the huge, the more dynamic, the more expansive YPS. There are a lot, you know, several millions of young people in Africa. They are promoting the cause of peace silently in non-official, in non-programmatic ways, in with their activities in their communities, with what they are doing. You look at young people in Ghana, young people in Kenya and a few other countries that have created tech-based, digital-based, you know, election monitoring, election monitor uh, tracking uh, applications. There are also young people who are also helping to use satellite imagery to help farmers to prevent farmer either conflict, to also track, you know, the movement of, of cattle, to track rainfall patterns and all of this. These are silent innovations taking place on the continent. And they are also part of the YPS agenda. Even if we don't, even if those young people don't call it YPS agenda, young people are using their creativity, their energies, their talents to change the continent. And we have to key into that. And this is my final point, that the fact that there is a former YPS agenda, the even I, I am not a big fan of empowering young people. Young people are empowering themselves, are empowering society. To, you, you know, young people are creating tech-based applications, tech-based solutions to the problems of their society. They are the ones that are building the, if the, IG, the digital infrastructure that is already serving Africa. And the more we have internet penetrability in Africa, the larger the impact of the activities of young people in things that normally causes conflict, causes disagreement, causes tension, like elections, like all of these things. Young people are creating solutions that increases people's confidence in those elections, solutions that help electoral commissions to be able to prevent electoral manipulation and fraud. So the fact that they are not calling YPS does not mean it's not happening. So there is the official YPS, which is commendable. I was part of it. I was the lead technical person that helped to draft the you know, YPS, EU YPS framework. But there is also the unofficial YPS that is huge. Young people are not waiting to be empowered. They are empowering themselves and they are changing society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wale. I think that's well noted. And I think uh, I, on this note, I would like to put uh, Chido on the spot before giving the chance to my director to have a, a quick reaction. Uh, Chido, on, uh, uh, when, I, when I look at the polling, I think there's a question that's joining here is that the priorities of young people are not aligned to African government. And the, the results are 37% uh, uh, are saying, also, sorry, 41% are saying somewhat aligned. And then about 47% are saying, no, they're not aligned. And, and then only 6% uh, are saying, yes, they are. Uh, do you have any reaction to that from, a, a, from a, a, an African Union perspective? Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Joe. Um, I think from an African Union perspective, I'd rather give this perspective as a fellow young person as well, um, given that I also represent the young people. And I think um, definitely there's more that can be done with member states uh, in terms of to ensure that the priorities are aligned to the needs of the young people. And one of the ways this can be done is to ensure that we start including more young people within the leadership structures and the decision-making structures in member states. I'll give one example when it comes to, um, you know, um, a few member states that have appointed um, youth advisors um, uh, within the presidential offices. We have Namibia that has a youth advisor to the president. And when you look at Namibia as well, it has one of the youngest um, MPs as well as, you know, uh, lots of young people within, um, you know, the parliament and within the, the policy making realm and within the government. Um, you know, and we, we also have in Ghana, we have a youth uh, presidential advisor who was in Ghana, um, as well as in Uganda. And I think, uh, you know, that comes as, you know, best practice that can be replicated across the member states to say, uh, how can we ensure that we have young people fully represented at decision-making level and at higher level to, to ensure that they can also influence the decisions, um, you know, and um, uh, in addition to this, also taking the bottom-up approach is very important. I think it's something uh, we're trying to be very intentional about within my office to say, how can we ensure that everyone is represented, including a grassroots level and a community level in the decision-making table? But then there are more voices that we need, um, you know, in this regard. And when I say there are more voices that we need, it means that we need more voices at the decision-making table in these leadership positions 
and more place, uh, more more opportunities they are created. I mean, if you looked at the example, if the example within the African Union, you know, with this, my position uh, was created as the chairperson's chairperson's youth envoy, and we're just four years into this role. Uh, I'm the second youth envoy, um, you know. Uh, and having said that, you know, we're still in the process of you know setting a foundation for this role. Given you know, if we look at even you know, we had COVID and a number of conflicts in between, but now we're in the process of reimagining, you know, resetting and setting the foundation to how we can further shape this role and ensure that you know even when it comes to the member states you know there is that support uh, that comes with it which goes back again to the listening tools because you know we noticed and identified there was that gap that within the african union um you know yes this appointment was made and you know i could be working closely um as well with the with the chairperson but we also need the buy-in and to ensure that member states fully understand what this role entails for young people, as well as what we can domesticate and bring to national level to the priorities of young people, which then, uh, you know, came about the 60 days it's into idea to ensure that when I get in a country, it also gives an opportunity um, you know, to 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 um, raise um, awareness and to say, to say, you know, on the ground, this is what young people need and what they require. Again, uh, I know because often we, you know, it's come up in the conversation when it comes to funding for young people, access to funding for young people. You know, also, you know, building into the process even within the African Union when it comes to even, um, you know, um, the, the the funding structure and the budget structure. This goes out to the to the member states, and the member states have the final say and the final decision in terms of allocation of budget. But you know, when we when we speak about that, it also entails that we need to raise more awareness about these issues. You know, and 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 to be able to lobby and say when there's that allocation of budget, let us ensure that you know we have a, a you know uh, allocation towards you know some of the youth initiatives that will be aligned and should be aligned to the priorities of the youth. And lastly, I also would love to hear more about this. I guess maybe outside of this webinar, um, you know, um uh, you know, young people are also free to reach out to, 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 to the Office of the Youth Envoy. Our email address is, you know, auyouthenvoy at africa-union.org so that, you know, we can also have, uh, you know, an, a better understanding in terms of some of the priorities that young people are saying that, you know, are not aligning. Because I believe that, you know, it's going to take that approach for us to collaborate, to listen to the young people and to learn, you know, and as much as I'm in this role, it's also an opportunity for me to learn from young people and ensure that where there's no alignment, I can be able to fully advocate and lobby on their behalf. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jido, and uh, it's well noted and uh, well taken. I'll give a, a, a word to a final word to uh, my director, uh, Ms. Amanda Dori. I, I know she's been listening to us patiently and she has some words for us as well. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Joelle, and to all of the, the panelists and participants today in this dialogue. It's been very energizing to hear the discussion in terms of the, the, the big issues and the, the different ways of tackling from the continental down to the national, down to the, the community level, youth involvement in at every level, and just the criticality of youth's ability to be active and connected and to really transform politics and society and economics. I, I take the, the point that no one needs to give the youth this opportunity that, you know, kind of youth are taking this opportunity in their engagements uh, at, at all of the different levels. I took note of the, the point in terms of both deepening and sharpening the messages of youth, because of course, uh, as discussed, they're not monolithic uh, youth positions out there, and, and they are very contextual in terms of what is important in, in different locations. But I think um, to, to the point of representation, that's really where it starts. The, at the AU level, clearly that's in place and, and critically important. The examples we were just hearing in terms of national level representation, uh, when, when there are youth representatives at the, the seat at have a seat at the table that is critically important and it has to cascade down. I guess the, the last piece that really resonated with me was the discussion about moving from a continental level strategy now into national action plans as a complement uh, to the, the work that needs to be done in addition to representation now and also the crafting of, of national level strategies. So clearly there's much work ahead I, I thank all of the, the panelists today for their participation. 
a special thanks to the AU Office of the Youth Envoy and the Youth for Peace programs for the partnership in, in this program today. And let me turn it back to you now, Joelle. Thank you, Amanda. And as requested, I think the AU also would like to say a few words. Uh, over to you, Chido. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jewell. Uh, perhaps um, uh, in, in that regard, because um, I have spoken um, you know, as part of being the panelist, but definitely uh, with regards to the AU, I'm giving a last word. Uh, I'll just check if, if, if we have um, um, the commissioner representative from the office. Um, I know he's currently in Kenya observing the election, but we'll still be on the call to give those last words. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um for, for um, having me. Uh, I'll turn off the video because my internet is not fantastic. Uh, but this has been, uh, first of all, a really, really great conversation. And um, I think uh, this is uh, one of the things that we're led to in terms of the partnership, how, uh, you know, policy and the academia can come together to advance conversations. And I think also the panel was really great following, of course, the openings by the NDU and by commissioner, then had um, both uh, someone from the academia, someone from research, and someone uh, who, you know, really is a practitioner. I think these are the, 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 the viewpoints we get to advance these conversations. Um, if I may, um, it's also just to acknowledge that um, uh, the AU is really big on the YPS agenda, and you can see the track record since 2018, what, what my, my very good friend Wadi refers to as the former YPS. Um, uh, I think for the, for the AU, you don't see the formal and informal because what we're doing really is to ensure that anyone working in that space is given, um, if you like, some policy backing to ensure that they're able to enhance their contributions, have them recognized, and have lessons learned to, in fact, uh, grow. Uh, the, the, the young people who are able to engage and promote uh, YPS. Um, from the side of the EU, you know, it's also just to say thank you so much to everyone who's joined in. Uh, this is one of several uh, conversations that we're hoping will come your way in partnership with uh, the NDU with ACSS. Um, you know, we're really looking forward to having these conversations around how we can continue to build this relationship to not only fully encourage uh, young people to be engaged in peace and security, but also to ensure that this dividend is multiplied uh, across the continent. So on behalf of my commissioner, let me once again say thank you so much uh, for, for this collaboration. We're looking forward to future engagements and the department uh, representing the aid remains committed to, to, to the YPS agenda. I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rooks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Amanda Dori. Uh, allow me again, on behalf of the Africa Center and the Office of the African Union Youth Envoy, the African Union for uh, Youth for Peace program, uh, thank our panelists, especially uh, for their insights today.